morning. Last week, now I guess we ended um, talking about some of the internal problems that Israel was facing. Remember now we looked at the foreign marriages, um, but we found out um, that after the 90 years plus since Zerubbabel uh, had led the first group back to Jerusalem from captivity, we found out that there was more than simply leadership and motivation problems um, in the physical problems, you know, of the wall and that. We find, Nehemiah finds, um, that there is uh, a lot of other spiritual problems in Israel. And if you turn to uh, Nehemiah 5, was where we ended up last week, we saw there that um, in the midst of rebuilding, um, the Jews were pretty taxed by the king. And uh, many had been moved to poverty. And then what we see happening was the more wealthier Jews were um, lending to the poor. Um, and they, the poor, they were forcing them to mortgage their properties. Some had to sell their sons and daughters into slavery. And the wealthier Jews were charging interest. Um, and when you think of that, um, that's pretty wild. That's exactly what the Gentiles done, and here are the Jewish people following that. And Nehemiah gathers the wealthier together, and we see his uh, qualities and his character here, because uh, he comes down. He comes down on them hard. He rebukes them, um, and he tells them, um, you know, that it was imperative for their safety that they maintain a right relationship with God. And by treating one another that way, certainly wasn't what, uh, what God had expected from them. And we looked at um, back in Exodus and Leviticus where they were uh, charged uh, with not charging uh, interest amongst each other. And then in verse 11 and 12 of chapter 5, we see where ne Nehemiah... Uh, urges the rich now to return the property that they had uh, gained and to restore the interest money back to those that uh, um, were poor and we see that they did that um, and the priests were called together um, and everyone promised that that would end and then in Nehemiah 8 verses 1 to 18 um, this is an important chapter uh, this tells of the spiritual revival among God's people through public reading of the scriptures. Ezra is now the main character in the next few chapters here, in uh, chapter 8 and on, I think, into 10. Um, and we see that he gathers together the people for a, a holy convocation, the Feast of the Trumpets. Remember, all this stuff has been forgotten. Um, with Israel being in captivity and uh, he brings them together and he reads to them for several hours and the people show their deep respect for God's word um, as the, the Levites we also I think we mentioned this last week that they help the people to understand a lot of the words um, just remember now they had they've been living in uh and dealing with Aramaic language and uh, Hebrew was really not a part of their language while they were in captivity. So it was necessary for them to understand a lot of the words explained to them. And then in verses 9 to 12 in that chapter, <clears throat> we see that the people's tears showed that the message of Ezra was taken seriously. Um, they were overcome with grief from what they were hearing. Um, but then they were directed into the thoughts of these feasts were for rejoicing. Um, and the, they, the fruits of the Spirit needed to be visible here. Um, they needed to show love to one another. Um, they needed to share with the less fortunate. Um, and their hearts needed to be at peace 
and, and rest with God. And their sadness needed to be turned to joy. And so for right on through to verse 18, um, we see the in verses 13 to 15, the very next day um, was a special time for Bible study for the leaders, um, the priests and the Levites. Um, they had even begun to discover ordinances that they had forgotten, such as the Feast of the Booths. Um, all, this, all these feasts had not been uh, followed, I think, except Zerubbabel, when he first went back, he began to remember the Feast of the Booths, somewhat, a partial observance of that. Um, but all these things had been forgotten um, through those years in captivity. And then uh, Nehemiah 10, Nehemiah 10, <coughs> verses 28 to 39, we see here now that the entire population agrees to observe and do all the commandments now of, of uh, their Lord and His ordinance, His statutes. And um, in verses 30 to 38, again, we see more specifically the Jews bound themselves now to refrain from foreign marriages and to again remember the Sabbath day and the sabbatical year to make annual contributions now for the temple services, um, even to what we would think might be minute points, but to provide wood for the altar of the Lord. All this stuff has been um, forgotten. And to bring the redemption money for their firstborn, the first fruits of their crops to the temple, and to res uh, such as restoring tithes, um, all this had been uh, forgotten. And um, in that chapter 10, 28, 39, um, concern for their religious life was central uh, in this covenant. Um, the covenant deals exclusively with the maintenance of the temple and its servants. Um, remember the, the Levitical priests, I think, at this time were forced to, they were taking jobs working in fields because they were not being supported um, by Israel. And we see here now that this is the neglect for God's house is being brought out. And Nehemiah is reminding them of, uh, of their situation. And in chapter 13, 6 to 9, um, upon Nehemiah's return, again, um, he doesn't take long to to tackle problems. Um, other problems had also appeared in his, his absence, and Nehemiah um, halts these evils. He takes control immediately. And, and in verses uh, 10 and 14, um, we see there again the restoration of the tithes uh, for the Levites. Um, and Nehemiah, if you notice, never shies away from rebuking the officials, uh, those that are to be in charge. Um, you know, he comes down on them. Sometimes we maybe avoid doing that. Uh, we pick on the weaker and leave the, the stronger, the ones that stand out, the leaders. Um, we don't mess with them too much. But we see here, Nehemiah's example is, no, it was wrong what they were doing and they needed to be corrected, and, and so he did. Um, and it's interesting to note, um, for that deed, we'll see this a little bit more, talk about it later, but Nehemiah, we notice, always asks God to remember him. He always goes to God with that observance. You know, we, we correct things, we do things, um, we don't see Nehemiah looking for praise from everyone else. He always goes to God and he, he, he tells God to remember me in these situations. Um, you know, which is uh, kind of interesting, I think. It's a, 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 a wonderful example. And in Nehemiah 13, 15 to 22, um, what problem do we see there? Anyone read that section? Nehemiah 13, 15 um, goes through a 
the length of Jeremy? They weren't observing the Sabbath, uh, and they were they were uh, profaning the Sabbath. I guess Nehemiah says uh, in verse seventeen, uh, and that's something that they shouldn't have been doing. Right. The Sabbath day was holy day to the Lord uh, for the Jews, and so they should have been respecting the Sabbath and not doing the work on the Sabbath like they were supposed to. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And and a lot of that problem arose from the. The, the Gentiles, the foreigners um, who lived among them, they, they were trying to make the Sabbath a market day. You know? um, but the Sabbath, as Jeremy said, was to be kept holy um, and by force, if necessary. Um, men were, we read there, men were sent to secure the gates and the greedy merchants that were camping outside the city, uh, they were run off, even to the point of threat of violence. You know, um, and a, 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 the illicit activity on the Sabbath came to a, an abrupt halt. And again, there we see in verse 22, Nehemiah says, And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. And again, the end of this verse, we see who does Nehemiah go to to ask to remember, to remember him. He says, remember me, O oh my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. Um, I find that very interesting, and we make a point of that um, again here after the marriages, that Nehemiah always just went to God looking for the praise, the thankfulness, the strength. He never sought it elsewhere, which, you know, um, something for us to consider uh, you know not only I believe was he strengthened through that but he knew who he was to seek the um, what's the word I'm short of a word there to seek the praise from uh, and that was God and not from man and then in Nehemiah 13 uh, 23 I, I put both these verses together at the end um, 23 to 31. Um, what do we see there? Right, right, Kyle. Again, we, we see this brought out, don't we? Um, and <clears throat> we spoke of this already, you know, the fact that and the dangers and, and the commands that Israel was giving about interracial marriages. Um, but did we notice um, the man Nehemiah in this situation? Um, throughout his rule, uh, Nehemiah was a man of action. And I always remind myself, Persia I put him in the place of being governor over this. So he also had to answer to them as they were his boss, but we never see that affecting his uh, trust in God, his strength to, to act as he ought to, it, it, as, as far as God's laws were considered. Um, if they went against, you know, whatever Persia said or desired, Nehemiah didn't do it, did he? He, he always did what God asked of him. And nowhere is it is that more evident than here? Um, because in these verses, as the zeal for, for the things of God consumed him, if you look over in Psalms, Psalm 69, just the thought of, of that, Psalm 69. Have uh, you got that, Jeff? 69 and verse 9, sorry. Yeah. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. It's a quote used for Jesus. The which? Uh, quote used for Jesus. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. Another comparison for, uh, we were speaking about last week, Nehemiah, um, kind of foreshadowing Jesus. Um, that's right. Nehemiah was consumed, and, and, because he was no respecter of persons, I think we can say that, because we saw that he not only blasted the leaders, he blasted the common people. 
um, he pointed out sinfulness to, to everyone. Um, and his anger was felt equally by all who transgressed the law of the Lord. Um, in, in reading these passages, we see that he warned, uh, he admonished, he, he reprimanded, uh, he contended with them. Um, even he struck those that were uh, being sinful. He pulled out hair. Um, you know, I, this doesn't say that we need to run around and pull out one another's hair, but that was Nehemiah's anger, and um, he done that to, to clue people in. And he generally made things difficult for the ungodly. He intended to, to make it difficult for them, to impress upon them. Um, he was a courageous man and a, a tenacious general in the front lines of the fight against evil. He was a tireless worker. And he was a great builder for God, or for, for God. And once more in verse <coughs> 31, we see that he asked the Lord um, that he be remembered in all that he had done. Um, so it's interesting to see how, uh, Jeremy? I was saying, going back to 23 to 29, he did something that we do today. He, he used an example. He, he gave a precept on divorce and strange wives, the King James would say, are foreign wives. And sometimes when we look at a command of God, we then go to an example from Scripture. This is why. Well, he used Solomon here as, as an example of why this wasn't good. He said, Solomon was beloved of God, and yet these women turned his heart. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so Nehemiah went to, to the Scripture that they had for an example as to why this was wrong. Not mm -hmm. that it was wrong, because it was, but sometimes when people give commands, they don't understand why. Uh, they say, well, God's just being harsh, or God's being unfair. And Nehemiah not only told them why, that it was wrong, but he gave an example of someone who followed God, but heart, his heart was turned away because he sinned. He called it out and outright sin. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't call it that. He called it sin. And we must not be afraid sometimes if someone's in sin to call it that. Uh, uh, even if that person is a king. Uh, so I just yeah. caught that from... No, that's a, that's a good point. Um, and the thought of using an example. Because, it, you know, as parents we do that a lot, don't we? When we try and correct our children. Um, well, I do. <laughs> I always say, look at the situations I've created in my life. It's because of those sins. But sometimes the younger, and even not the younger alone, many adults, our attitude is, well, it happened to you, but it won't happen to me. Well, you know, as Jeremy pointed out, you're a king. It happened to a king. You know, and, and one that was so blessed with God's uh, grace and love and guidance, you know. So it, it is a good point to remember um, the example. So, and so then we move out of the work of Nehemiah into the rebuilding of the wall. Um, and archaeology again uh, helps us here a little bit. Um, with our story. <clears throat> Here's a section of uh, Nehemiah's wall, the, the rebuilding of it that was discovered, dug up, and uh, been preserved. Um, and like I say, uh, they're interesting. We see that these stories, um, these aren't fairy tales. You know, we believe the Word of God because it is the Word of God, but um, archaeology helps prove those points. Um, yeah, no. And so, thinking of Nehemiah's wall, we're asked, how long did it take for the Jews to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem? And, and what impact did this have on their, their enemies? And we read Nehemiah 6. Nehemiah 6, verses uh, 15 
to 60. Um, Gordon Collard, do you want to read those two verses? Uh, the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month. Hello. Over 16. When all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence, for they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Okay, so how, in those two verses, then, how, how long did it take? 52 days. Um, you know, that's quite a feat, really, when you think about it. Um, and we see the power of, of something here um, without reading the, the whole story, but turn back to Psalms and Psalms 133. Psalms 133. And we read verses uh, 1 to 3. Um, maybe Lisa and and Sandra and then Shidam, do you want to read a verse each? Psalms 133, and we'll read the, the three verses of that chapter. Okay, what do we find in those three verses um, that we see in our story of the rebuilding of the wall? Right, Kala. Yeah, unity. Um, Nehemiah, remember, um, he gets the people together. He encourages them. He he, uh, he looks at the problem first, gets a solution for the problem, and um, everyone is drawn together. Everyone is working together. And then in 52 days, um, you know, they uh, complete this wall and. You know, if we try and look at the, the feat they've done and we think of the, the amount of days, it's, it's maybe hard for us to really understand, but we see by the actions of their, of their enemies um, that tell us what an amazing feat this was. Because remember, their enemies had tried long and hard to discourage them in the efforts of, of building, but to no avail. Uh, they finished the, pro uh, the, the project, and then how did this affect the enemies, all their enemies, according to those verses? The fact that they built that in, in 52 days. In other words, did they say, like, nah, no problem, we could have done it? Right. That's a good example for for a New Testament verse. Um, and we see that happening here, didn't we? That's what their enemies saw. Um, they knew that God's hand was behind them in, in the rebuilding of, of that wall. You know what it's Jeff? <coughs> an interesting statement. Uh, Which verse? Well, the end of what you asked. Oh. About the enemies perceiving that the work was done by God. Because some would look at it and go, well, the people did the work. Ah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, it, I just find it interesting because, well, first of all, who made us? So anything that we're actually able to do, and any skill that we actually have, we didn't make it. God gave it to us. Right. So even just the physical accomplishing 
But secondly, how long did that wall get, stay down? Uh, and it only took 52 days when they actually were motivated and energized to do it. We motivated them. You know, we see actually with God through, the, through Nehemiah. Right. So in every way, whether it's our physical abilities or our understanding and our motivation to do something, it's done because of God. And ultimately, not because of us, because we don't we didn't make ourselves and we don't have the plan mm -hmm. for doing and building. And God gives us that and the motivation is. Right. I just find it interesting that some people can look at that well, they actually did it. How did God do it? They did it. Right. Not so. That's right. Which tells you people see uh, and do understand the effects of God, don't they? They may not admit it, um, but you're right. They they saw right from the beginning. They saw the man Nehemiah, who was devoted to God. Uh, unity is something from God. It's not really something we practice. We sit or do things ourselves. Um, but you're right. All the way through, um, they see that too. Well, and, and even in verse nine, they prayed to God for them for God to strengthen their hands. They said, uh, for they have all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Prayer works. Uh, God God wanted the wall to be done. He did exactly what they asked. And the wall was done. They physically had to do the work, yes, but God helped them. Uh, and uh, God helps us today in ways we may not understand or we may not know. But they prayed, and God answered their prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just makes me think of a, because the gospel meeting's coming up and handing out flyers. You know, a lot of doors you go to, uh, sometimes you're not really received too well. Or the door can be shut in your face, or you can get some pretty nasty uh, comments. But remember, the Lord told us, you know, go in twos sometimes. And we wonder why. Well, because we are strengthened from one another. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're made stronger in heart. Um, you know, and that's, that's how God helps us in those situations. And I see that here. Um, you know, through their prayer, um, God strengthens them to uh, to continue. They took a lot of adversity. We we'll talked about that later on in our lesson here. I don't want to get into that too much. Um, but, yeah, we finish this. Well, we are into that um, thought, into the opposition uh, to rebuilding. Remember in chapter 2, um, we saw Nehemiah arriving in Jerusalem and immediately him and a, a few men, he takes a few men at night, they survey the damage to the wall and they begin their plans. And I found this picture here of a, a section of the, the old wall. Um, it just kind of helps us imagine um, the enormity of the project ahead. You know, I, I don't think these guys had excavators and and uh, bulldozers to do this project. Um, you know, it's a lot of, of work and a lot of handling of stone. I remember on the farm, every spring you used to have to pick stones out of the field. Um, and you just leave the tractor and the lowest gear you could get, you'd have the hay wagon behind it, and you walked and picked stones all day. Um, you know, it got pretty depressing when you found ways to keep motivated, but, um, you know, a project like this, in their day and age, everything is by hand, a donkey and a wooden cart. Um, but after the inspection, we see that Nehemiah makes a decision to go ahead. Uh, and immediately, as soon as that decision is made, um, opposition arises immediately after that. But not from the people, though. Not from the people that are going to help rebuild it, but from bystanders. Um, those who had no use for the Jews, namely one man called uh, Sanballat, Jeff mentioned him last week, the Hornite, and, the, and another one named Tobiah. Uh, he was an Ammonite official. 
Um, and something to help us with our story here was found in the early part of, of our 20th century. A collection of uh, papyri, which is uh, another name for documents, was found at and around a, a Jewish colony that was located um, near a place called Aswan uh, at El Fatim. It, it's an island in the Nile River. Um, and the discoveries there included uh, these documents that were written in Egyptian, Greek, and Aramaic. And uh, the ones that are written in, Amer in Aramaic um, have become valuable for a, a lot of Bible study. They don't contain any copies of the scriptures, but they do deal with a variety of matters ranging from uh, political to religious uh, situations, family, business, literary concerns. And in that collection of papyri, look what was found. There's a document here that mentions uh, this very man, Sanballat. He's mentioned in that uh, papyri that was found. And I thought, hmm, pretty interesting. He did exist. And then there was another one found in that collection, and uh, it mentions Tobiah. Both of them characters are recorded there. Um, you know, it just helps us in, in our assurances of, of, of these stories. Again, these aren't fairy tales. And the Jews um, were not a liked people. Okay? Um, the nations around them hated them. And uh, they did everything possible to interfere with their well-being and, and their progress. And uh, with that thought, we look into this question of listing the tactics employed um, by the enemies of the Jews who opposed um, the rebuilding of their walls. In Nehemiah 2, in verse 19, in the very beginning, um, what tactic do we see here? Um, chapter 2, verse 19. Uh, Henry, I'll get you to read that, please. Ezra, or Nehemiah 2, verse 19. By the way, you sound like that. The Ammonites, Apicia, Gerson, the Irish, the Babi, the Mark, and Reddit, the Irish. What is the news of the Irish? Are you preparing against the king? So what do we see there? What tactic is uh, Sam Ballot and Tobiah, and we're even mentioning another character in there, uh, Jashem? An error. What tactic do they use? They go? Yeah, mockery. They tried to belittle them, don't they? Um, they tried to use intimidation by saying that they were rebelling against their king. Um, you know, does, does, does something like this work? It work, does it? It's pretty powerful stuff. We probably all, each one of us, has, has faced this. Um, and probably will face it. It doesn't end. Um, but it's interesting. Look at Nehemiah's response in verse uh, 20. Um, do you want to read that, Cherry? Uh, chapter 2, verse 20. takes courage to say that, doesn't it? Nehemiah. Flat out. The God of heaven himself will prosper us. It takes courage to say that, but also we see where Nehemiah draws his strength from, doesn't it? Because he believes that. 
Um, and so through his belief, that strengthens him, uh, enables him to say that, you know. Um, in Nehemiah 4, <coughs> 1 to 3, um, let's read those verses. Uh, and you could take one and then Tim 2 and come up to Jeff. Nehemiah 4. he undermines the Jews' integrity uh, too, doesn't he? In hopes of setting others against them. He's trying to gather a allies for himself, isn't he? To, to, to weigh down on the Jews. And uh, Nehemiah's response, verse 4. Uh, Mom, do you want to read that, please? Chapter, uh, chapter 4. Chapter yeah, Nehemiah 4, verse 4. Hear our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. Nehemiah is pretty harsh here, isn't he? That prayer was fine um, under the old law. Of course, we live under the, the age of grace. Um, you know, we're to, to love our enemies, we're to leave vengeance to who? to God, but nonetheless, um, we can go to the Lord and ask Him for the strength um, to overcome. I just think of, uh, of Romans 12 in, in verse uh, 19 to 21. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will keep, keep coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with God. Um, remember, like Nehemiah, I remind myself, we go to God looking for the thanks. So we leave the revenge to him, and then we ask him to watch over us and strengthen us. In, uh, in those times of adversity. And uh, chapter 4, 7, and 8, um, we see there now a gathering of, of the enemies again. Uh, again, they're filled with jealousy and anger. And uh, if you look in verse 9, we see again Nehemiah's response um, to this. Um, Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. It's, it's interesting to note there um, that Nehemiah goes to God in prayer, but also God gives us tools with which to work. And we see Nehemiah here does just that. Nothing wrong with that, um, you know. He sets men at the gates. Um, and to protect, um, but he still continues his prayer, um, you know. In, in verse 10, uh, uh, we see here again, then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. Um, there's a lot of discouragement. Remember the picture of that wall. Um, discouragement everywhere 
is, uh, is mounting, um, which makes the job of the leaders um, that much more. And I guess we'll have to leave it there till next week. Um, we'll look at the last three of those next week, and there's only a couple more questions. We'll finish that off when they get into Okay, thank you.